When you look at the career of Wally Dallenbach Jr., you could say he had many turning points during his time behind the wheel. From the opportunity to chase down the open wheel dream, to winning races for manufacturer teams in sports car racing, and even cheating death at Pikes Peak. Whoa. But if there was one point that really stood out to me, it was when Wally didn't have much of a future in NASCAR after 1995. That was until a one race deal with Bud Moore and a last minute sponsor came together to form a full year agreement to give Wally another chance at the cup level. This is Turning Point, Wally Dallenbach Jr. Wally Dallenbach Jr. began his transition from sports cars to NASCAR in 1991 when he made 11 starts for Junie Donlevy in the number 90 Ford. He then signed to run full-time in 1992 with Trans Am and IMSA team owner Jack Roush in the number 16 Keystone Ford. After two seasons at Roush, Wally was tapped to the throne of the king to drive the number 43 for Petty Enterprises in 1994. But after 20 races, he was released from the team. Even though Dallenbach lost his ride, he didn't lose his desire to be in NASCAR. He didn't want to give up on the pursuit, even if it meant that he had limited opportunities to get behind the wheel. In 1995, Dallenbach only made two Cup Series starts at both the road courses. In Sonoma, Wally made the field, but unfortunately finished 39th in his John Streiser owned Chevy. At Watkins Glen, he drove the number 22 MBNA Pontiac for Bill Davis Racing. He was leading with seven laps to go until he was passed by former teammate Mark Martin for the lead. Dallenbach still went on to finish a more than impressive second, matching a career best. Wally would also make his Truck Series debut at Sonoma in the fall, driving the number 18 Kurt Rohrig owned Chevy, where he would go on to finish second. The success Wally Dallenbach had in his limited starts impressed Cup Series owner Bud Moore. Walter Maynard Bud Moore Jr. was a World War II veteran who participated in the Normandy landings in 1944 in an operation to help liberate Europe. He received five Purple Hearts and two Bronze Stars for his service. Moore was also a staple car owner in NASCAR. His team, Bud Moore Engineering, had participated in the sport since 1961. They've captured two championships and 63 victories in the Cup Series. For many fans, it wasn't race day unless a Bud Moore owned car was in the field. Moore's team was without a driver or sponsor for the 1996 season. So Moore and Dallenbach came together in the winter and agreed to attempt to qualify for the Daytona 500 and possibly run a partial schedule permitting sponsorship. Speaking of sponsors, before Speed Weeks 96 was set to kick off, Hayes Microcomputer Products stepped up to sponsor the number 15 Bud Moore Engineering Ford during the Daytona 500. If you didn't know what Hayes Microcomputer Products made, they made modems. I love that sound. Hashtag modem money. Just think it's the 90s, everybody needs a modem. How else are you gonna access the internet? It seemed that all the pieces were falling into place for both driver and team. Dallenbach knew that driving for Budmore Engineering in a car prepared by crew chief Jimmy Means could give him a legitimate chance at winning the Daytona 500 and also to prove everyone that he could get it done on the NASCAR ovals. However, there wasn't a guarantee that the team would be in the race. 51 cars attempted to qualify for the 1996 Daytona 500 and out of all of the cars to submit times during Sunday's single car qualification, the number 15 Ford Thunderbird for Budmore Engineering submitted the 23rd fastest time. Budmore and Jimmy Means didn't bring a car to qualify. They brought a car to race. So the group turned their attention to the Thursday duels. Dallenbach started 12th in duel race number one, and from the drop of the green flag, he drove his white Thunderbird towards the front. The strategy was for Wally and the team to stay linked up with the lead draft. If he's in the lead draft, he's probably running single file in the top 10. He's not in the back of the pack trying to fight for a transfer position. Even with threatening rain, the number 15 held on to the lead pack during the entire race, staying well ahead of a multi-car wreck late in the race to finish fifth, giving Dallenbach the ninth starting position in the Daytona 500. 
Bud Moore's car showed lead pack pace throughout speed weeks, and with a top 10 starting position, the number 15 was a dark horse pick to win the Daytona 500. But on 8 a.m. race day morning, Dennis Hayes, yes, the Dennis Hayes of Hayes Microcomputer Products, wanted to meet with Bud Moore to deliver some special news. You see, Dennis Hayes decided that he wanted to sponsor Bud's car for the entire season. What? The race hasn't even been run, dude. Like, what? Now, Dennis Hayes didn't just hastily get into this deal. There were a few reasons why Hayes wanted to be a part of NASCAR. NASCAR had just launched their first ever web publication, NASCAR.com, during speed weeks of 1996. And during the first week, the website had over 1 million hits. That's just crazy. That was in like 1996 when the internet wasn't as popular as it is today. It showed that NASCAR fans were online. But they weren't just online browsing the web, they were also playing one of the most immersive simulations of the time, NASCAR Racing, and NASCAR Racing 2. The game allowed players to play interactively over a phone line, which Haynes saw. Haynes wasn't alone with his thinking, as he went to Daytona with several marketing personnel and the vice president of finance for his company. The group spent Friday and Saturday meeting with various people within the industry, and came to the realization, we could spend several months analyzing it, and we wouldn't know much more than we would at the end of the day, Saturday. This is crazy to think that these people just came in, looked at the sport over two days, and made their assessment right then and there to sign for the full season. I mean, I'm not arguing it against it because it it's a great deal. <laughs> it's very sudden. <laughs> and with that, that pretty much sums it up, right? Oh, well except for the fact that there's still a race to run. Early in the running, Wally Dallenbach made his way into the top five. He had a fast car, and he wasn't afraid to use it. But by lap 50, Wally had drifted outside of the top 25 with a tire going down. When Derek Cope brought out the caution on lap 55, it gave Jimmy Means a chance to give his driver four new tires and for him to fine tune his Thunderbird after early contact. As the race went back to green, the team decided to hang towards the back of the field. With the caution out on lap 131, it bunched up the field and led to a multi-car accident a few laps following the restart on lap 137. During the caution, Bud Moore calculated making it to the finish on fuel if the race went green. The longest fuel run the team had made was 58 laps, and by topping off before the restart with 59 laps to go, Bud Moore was willing to gamble to win the Daytona 500. With 50 laps to go, Dallenbach had found himself inside the top 10, which was great because they weren't done wrecking behind him, as another multi-car accident would bring out the caution on lap 165, spoiling Bud Moore's fuel strategy. So, under caution, Moore and Means brought Dallenbach in with the leaders and gave him two tires, and the final adjustments he would need to make a run towards the finish. With 30 to go, Dallenbach made his way through the pack into the top five with help from Bill Elliott on the inside line. He then proceeded to push Dale Jarrett into the lead. Dallenbach then fell in line behind Jarrett and Dale Earnhardt before Kenny Schrader shuffled him towards the back of the six car lead draft. With nine to go, the pack had doubled to 12 cars and Dallenbach was forced in the middle and out of the lead draft. Just as quickly as the pack strung out, the leaders accordion back together in a 10-car draft with Wally Dallenbach in 8th. He picked off Ricky Rudd, then battled side-by-side -side with Bill Elliott on the last lap. With a little help from Ted Musgrave, Dallenbach crossed the line in 6th. The finish was a career best for Wally in the Great American Race. After Daytona, a huge weight had been lifted off of both driver and team. Bud Moore couldn't have been happier with the result, stating, we came out of Daytona with a sponsor and a top 10 finish. It's a great feeling. We don't have to come back and start laying off people and close up shop. The team and Wally Dallenbach only got better as the season progressed. Dallenbach would improve his oval qualifying efforts each week, only failing to make one race throughout the season. The team would finish the season with 12 finishes inside the top 20 and a best finish of third. At season's end, Moore and Dallenbach would part ways and Hayes modems would leave the sport. 1996 would mark the final full season for Bud Moore Engineering in the NASCAR Cup Series. Wally Dallenbach continued to drive in the Cup Series for teams such as Sabco and Hendrick Motorsports until 2001. 
when he stepped into the booth to start calling NASCAR races for NBC and Turner Sports. It's wild to imagine that there was a point where Wally was almost out of the sport of NASCAR, but one strong performance in the season opening race proved to be the turning point for Wally Dallenbach Jr.'s NASCAR career. Hey everyone, thanks again for watching. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and uh, feel free to listen to this episode of our podcast where we actually interviewed Wally Dallenbach Jr. And he talks to us a lot about 1996 and, you know, his other racing ventures. Give it a listen and tell us what you think.